Welcome to the Author Road Again podcast. I'm Chris. I'm Ross. This is our podcast about anything and everything off road. Tonight, Ross is going to talk about a lot of stuff because I haven't done anything in forever. Mm -hmm. I literally just go to kid sporting events and sleep. Yep. Uh, I don't go to kids sporting events and thankfully I've been sleeping a little bit more. So yeah, I, I, I shouldn't say sleep cause I'm not doing that. So that was, that was <laughs> fun, fun sideways uh, joke there. So what's the line? this is our show about everything, anything and everything off road. And sure. Chris is in KC and I'm in the Northeast. Yep. Doing some role reversal tonight. Sure. Yeah. So I will jump right into my shit. So press cars, there's been a bunch. I feel like we haven't really gotten into them much lately. We've had some guests and we haven't spent much time on the on the cars that have come through my house. We did talk about the Alpina, right? The XB7? Yes. Okay, yeah. good. I would like to talk about that again in depth. I loved that thing. It was fantastic. So after that, I had the obviously very off-road centric Mercedes AMG C43 sedan, which in its prior iteration was a six cylinder with a whole bunch of power. And it was basically like the, the C63 light, you know, it was the same kind of suspension and handling goodies, but with the smaller engine, the new C43 is a turbocharged four cylinder with a hybrid. And it is 400 ish horsepower. And what? yeah, that's a lot. It's a, it's a very high output for a four cylinder and Mercedes is very, very proud to say that it's got F1 tech because it uses the electric motor for torque fill when you go between gears so that the turbo doesn't have to spool. Well, the turbo spools, but the electric motor fills it in. So there's no lag. And it's, it's one of those things where they took something that they had and said, look, look what we can do with it. And they put it in a passenger car. Um, so the one I had was actually looked exactly like the car that's in this picture here. Um, if it was in that weird matte gray finish and it looked great, um, seats, super comfortable, uh, you know, tons of ambient lighting, fun stuff. Um, but <sighs> for context, I don't like reading or watching or listening to car reviews of vehicles that I haven't yet driven when I know that I'm going to drive them just because it's like, it's like reading movie reviews before you see a movie, you know, like unless it's a, a fucking, you know, Fast and the Furious movie or some shit where you can write the whole thing yourself. Like you want to go in and not know what's happening. Right. Um, so I didn't read any reviews of this car or anything. And I went in and I was like, Oh, it looks good. It's got all this cool stuff going on, you know, plenty of interior goodies. Um, and I drove a few miles in it and then was like, uh, uh, some like I, I, my gut here can't be right. So I went on YouTube and I watched the throttle house review of this car. And Thomas from throttle house called this the worst car he has driven all year. And oh, wow. I am going to agree. Um, it is horrible. It's not horrible. It's a good car. It does all the good car things. It's, you know, like it's, it's, it's safe and it's, it's it, it, it's yeah well we can leave it at it's safe um it's just it's safe. it is an an a demonstration in over complexity for the sake of over complexity and just like they did stuff that they shouldn't have done and it ruined everything like i mean first of all the you know the the goodies of the whole thing the power that you know are supposed to make it fast yeah it's great and all but there's no interaction with it whatsoever so it doesn't really feel that fast and it's also so heavy now that it just like isolates you from any semblance of speed whatsoever so there's like no difference between what you feel in in this amg car versus what you'd feel in a non-amg car because you're just so isolated from everything um and the powertrain is just fucking awful. Like, really? Yeah, it's a ton of power for a four cylinder. But just like, how many times on the show have we done the Jeff Goldblum from Jurassic Park? Like, they were so concerned with whether they could, they didn't stop to think if they should. 
You know, yeah. it's, it's it's that to a T. Like the electric motor and the turbo four and the transmission, it's like they were programmed by different companies. And like there is no way you can be smooth in the car unless you put it into like full kill massive aggressive mode which makes it just unbearably stiff um it's like what you know when you roll onto the throttle slowly going away from stoplight and the vehicle's supposed to move away slowly as like in correspondence with the gas pedal position this car doesn't do that it's like okay. engine electric transmission all trying to do different things at the same time and it honestly from like accelerating from a stop on an uphill is it, it felt like a like a first time or manual transmission get away from a from a red light gross yeah not good um and the ride quality around here it was just oh, it was brutal it was just like you everything goes through your spine it's that kind of jarring um and this car was eighty thousand dollars. Like what? A ton of money for, you know, for a, a C class AMG car that's not a sixty three. And yeah, it sucks because I love Mercedes as a brand. Um, obviously, you know, other than McLaren, Mercedes is my number one go to F one team, and I want to see the stuff trickle down, and I want to see it create cars that are successful in that capacity but it is just not a successful car um and i at least feel somewhat validated in saying this because i started going around looking at other stuff and was like wow nobody actually really liked this thing all that much so swing and a miss there on the c43 which is a bummer because you know it's it could have been it could have been great if it you know if it was executed to a more than half baked degree so, oh, long breath after talking that long. I spent a lot of the day talking in meetings and shit. So, it's uh, yeah, it's been a long one. But okay, so it it looks fine, subjectively, since I don't get to ride yeah. them. It looks fine, but it looks fine. Um, the back looks like a uh, like an Alpha, like a Julia, which is unfortunately a little derivative because for so long the AMG cars were so. There was the three pillars of German saloons, you know, it was Audi, BMW, and Mercedes, and they all looked like nothing else. And this new C from the back looks like an Alpha. And it's like, I don't, the last, I would say the last two generations of Mercedes, I haven't been that big a fan. Yeah, they're, they're not BMW. They haven't right. gone completely not, off the end, but like, it's oh just not appealing. XM, an XM drove through my neighborhood today while I was outside and it was like, Holy shit, somebody actually bought one. Yeah. <laughs> um, I got cut off by an X1 or X2 in traffic the other day, mm -hmm. and I was like, I I yeah. want to ram you. You're I had an X1. <laughs> I had an X1 to cut, uh, probably a month back for a week, and it was, it was a phoned-in money printer of a BMW. But it was fine. It was a fine car. You know? Yeah. It does so, job. Speaking of fine cars, transitions here. So then, so the Mer Mercedes, the Mitsubishi Outlander P H E V S E L S A W C. That's the full name. Oh, there's a lot it's of a, letters and numbers. It's a it's a really fancy name and uh, look for what's basically just a gussied up Nissan Rogue with a hybrid, a plug-in hybrid powertrain. And okay. It looks great. Like it, it, it's actually a really attractive looking vehicle from the front, in my opinion, at least. And and my wife pulled in the driveway and was like, I thought that was like an Evoke, like a mini Range Rover. Huh. Uh, yeah, they they really rebodied this Rogue very well. Um, so this is a tricky one because on the surface everything is great. You know, you get in and there's a big screen and it's got quilted leather. You know, it's it's a fifty thousand dollar Mitsubishi plug-in hybrid crossover here, and 
you know, and it, and it looks like this. It, it's the most aggressive looking Mitsubishi since like an eclipse, you know, because an Evo is only aggressive because of flares and a wing. Right. And, you know, it looks good and it has like actual presence for a crossover that size. And then driving it around in EV mode is fine because it's an EV and it's got four different modes. It's got EV mode, save, charge, and normal. So I ran it in charge a bunch of the time because it arrived with very little battery and um, with very little charge. Sorry, wrong vernacular there. So I, uh, I ran it in charge a lot to use the engine to, to um, replenish the EV part of it. Yeah. And, you know, this is a $50,000 small, medium-sized crossover, and running it on just the engine alone, I was getting, like, low 20s mile per gallon, which is not good because I put 110 miles on this thing. So, like, that's not great. And the engine just drones and drones and drones. Um, but, you know, this is for the person that doesn't want to dig deeper than I bought a plug-in hybrid at a, a low APR and, you know, and it's like comfortable and it does everything. It doesn't ask any questions of you. Like, right. it's fun. Um, it. We drove it through a lot of rain, and when you would go over some potholes and the back, the front would go over it fine, and then the back tires with the puddle. And if you're going around a corner, it would kind of skip a little bit, which I didn't like all that much. Um, but given it was also an 8,000-mile press car, which in dog years is, you know. I'm seven. Due for retirement. So, yeah, so that was here until today. It has been replaced by the Nissan Altima 2.5 SL all-wheel drive, which is a a thirty-seven mouthful, a thirty-seven thousand dollar base motor Altima. Um, I I haven't driven it or put any miles on it. You know, I backed it up into my driveway, and and the one thing I will say is that the backup camera resolution is comically bad. But you know, they on brand for Nissan. On brand for Nissan, the and I'm not making this up. Like the Frontier's backup camera is terrible, Pathfinder's backup camera is terrible. This isn't a secret. Like I'm not, you know, trashing Nissan here for unfounded reasons. Like it really is a, a, a miserable backup camera on these things. Um, but I don't know. Sat in for a few, and the seats are comfy. So yeah, we'll see. I'll put some miles on it this week. I'm struggling and, to find an actual photo of an SL. Oh, uh, <laughs> uh, just, just, just pull up a 2024 Altima. That'll suffice. If they're, it's they're all the the um, SR. Uh, they're all the SR version. Yeah, they all kind of look the same. The SR just got get some like blackout grill. I think it even has the same wheels. So, yeah, you know, it almost looks like an Infinity at this point. But a little bit. I want to rag on the Altima because well, I, I don't want to rag on the Altima. That's 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 like the joke and the trope of automotive media today. You know, like the and the Altima is the fastest car on the road. You know, and all that stuff. Well, I wouldn't I wouldn't rag on the Altima the car itself. I would rag on Altima buyers. Yeah, Altima buyers are the new uh, Mustang drivers leaving cars and coffee. That's the it was the uh, highest percentage of subprime automotive loans purchased yes. Nissan Altimas. Correct. So I, I don't want to rag on the car because of that, because that's unfounded and not doing fairness upon the vehicle itself. Um, and I, you know, kudos to Nissan for actually continuing to build a car. Like we're we were just. Talking about Mitsubishi, they're down to the Mirage. They've been down to the Mirage for years. Like I, I do, even though they killed, you know, the Maxima. Like they're still the Altima and they're still the Century. That's good. I'd rather that happen than them just be like, oh, guess what? We made a crossover between our seven other crossovers. And the four hundred Z. Yeah, and the Z, and they do make a Z. Which so fun facts about the Altima is my mom and dad went on a trip to Upper Peninsula of Michigan. And on the way back, the morning of their long transit back, they hit a deer, as you do. Um, In the UP? Impact happened 
just behind the driver's side wheel well on her Subaru Ascent. And then the, the deer decided to like cartwheel down the side. Um, luckily, didn't break any of the glass. Uh, they were able to drive it and keep on their long ass day home. Um, but her courtesy car was a Nissan Altima loaner. Mm -hmm. And she had to catch herself every now and then being like, this is kind of a good little car. I was like, mom, you are not going to stay in a car. You bitch at me all the time about seating position. <laughs> Like, yeah, and she got her ascent back, it's, and she's super happy to get back into it. But it served its purpose; it did car things. Yeah, it's it's remarkable when, I mean, we're we're deep into this enthusiast world, and and we do things to our vehicles and with them, and modify them in ways that make them worse at being everyday vehicles. And it's that's that's why when you get in like a, an Altima, it's like a palate cleanser, and you're like, holy shit, like basic ish cars are really good now you know they don't mm -hmm. ask anything of you they have all your tech they're comfortable you know it, it, it's kind of wild <laughs> spending time with a car that's just a car you know um that's why even the outlander was like oh wow this is kind of good like yeah it's expensive as fuck but like if all you need to do is get in it every day start it and get the oil changed every six or ten thousand miles or whatever it is now like yeah it's great um what's not great we're recording this on tuesday october 17th i was supposed to take a cyber yellow manual transmission cadillac ct5 v blackwing to my best friend's wedding next week which mm -hmm. would have been a great road trip car uh pretty much the perfect road trip sedan to go from Connecticut to South Jersey, in my opinion. Um, and one Mr. Matthew Farrow was supposed to have driven this very same car on the road and track Hudson thing, whatever it is they do, their fancy road and track like event. The vines and drives or whatever. Yeah. And I think that's a California one. I don't, I can't remember what the, what the Hudson Valley one is, but they're going to do like Lime Rock and all the Hudson Valley stuff. Um, and unfortunately for both him and me, uh, this this very car was subject to um, some body damage yesterday. So it it is called the Quattro Centro. Okay. The Road and Track experiences Hudson Quattro Cento. Okay. Well, I put an extra R in Centro. It's just oh, Cento. So saying, yeah, it's a four hundred. Well. Needless to say, the, the Blackwing, <laughs> Blackwing was not attending the Quattro Cento, and uh, it will, as of now, not be attending my best friend's wedding, which I am bummed about. And the potential replacements to take this trip are either a non-Blackwing CT5 or the 2024 Telluride. So I know for this Telluride. show's purposes, the Telluride is the much more interesting proposition. And I think that's the more well, comfortable selection, too. More than a full size sedan? Yeah, I really like the way the Telluride rides. Yeah. I just don't like I that drove engine. it off road on dirt shit and yeah. took it on an off road course. Like, oh man, I don't know. I put a couple hundred miles on one last year and that engine is just like, it's fine, but it's like, ugh. <laughs> it's no replacement for what you were going to have, but of the <laughs> two, less than half the horsepower. Actually, yeah, it's like a third of the horsepower. Yes, so, and, and it's an automatic. But yeah. So, um, yeah, so thanks to Eric for trying to line that up. And uh, my heart weeps a bit for that car's well-being. So, yeah, so that's uh, that's press car land. That catches us up since I think we skipped over a bunch of this stuff with a few of our recent guests. Probably. Um, in the land of my Lexus GX. I finally completed and posted the White Knuckle Off-Road Rock Slider install article on Hooniverse. So please check that out. Again, White Knuckle was extremely kind in sending those over for me to test. I have not tested them on the rocks just yet. I hope to soon. Um, and I continue to apologize for my stupidity and not exactly knowing how to how to read. <laughs> so, how to read. Yeah, what to do with some of the components that were uh, that were present, but I didn't know they were present because I 
I'm a novice when it comes to this stuff, and I have no shame in admitting it. So yeah, they're pretty go check solid surface. Yeah, they they sent me the ones with the tread plate that I think they call it dimpled tread plate, which is you know what those big old holes in the top are for. Yeah, um, and it has like a grippy ish surface. I might end up doing a uh, like a skateboard grip tape on it just for a little extra grippiness, you know, because it tends to rain here like six days a week now. Um, Done some of that this way. It hadn't rained in weeks. Oh, God. Dude, it's not even... It's it's unreal how much rain we've gotten here. Um, I think it was like the second rainiest September since like 1898 or something like that. And don't quote me on that, but it, it was a long fucking time since we got this much... This much precipitation here which i really hope doesn't translate to what this winter is going to be like but we'll find out uh, uh the el nino maps i've been seeing I you're fucked i know i <laughs> yeah i normal weird. winter because i the above average stuff is north of me mm-hmm. but all the cooler and wetter stuff is south of me but it curves up to the northeast the the mid-atlantic moved yeah yeah the trough i'm i'm in the normal trough you're... and the hot trough is above and the cold trough is below yep you've pushed it in my direction um, actually, I didn't do any of the pushing. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, so please go check that out on the Hooniverse. And uh, yeah, the scan, go- scan gauge I'm going to install shortly. Um, I've been talking when to a few. When it's not raining. <laughs> when it's not raining, because again, my truck doesn't fit in my garage because that was short-sighted. Uh, but yeah, I've been talking to a few different people about different scan gauge mount locations. Um, there's a company that makes one for the little vent that's on the dashboard right by the A-pillar, but I don't really like that location because if I get hit head-on that direction, I'm going to get a scan gauge in my face, and I'd prefer to not get a scan gauge in my face. You do, So you know the solution there. Don't get hit. Don't get hit, yeah. Well, <laughs> unfortunately for uh, for the world of driving, as everybody knows, you can't control that shit. So yeah, I'm I'm thinking about a few other places, possibly like in the overhead cubby where the push down sunglasses thing lives, mm-hmm. or maybe just down by the radio, somewhere like out of the way. Um, you know, the ideal place for something like this, and the same thing with the phone, and the same thing with any kind of radio where you have to tune channels or whatnot, is the least out of the sight lines and line of vision as possible. So if you need to check something, you're not just taking your eyes off the road. Um, but, and this is like a common complaint. The uh, the GX is very space limited. It is a really shockingly small and cubby free interior. interior in the front. Um, I mean, comparably like a fifth gen forerunner is, is enormous in terms of like where you can put shit. Uh, so it, there's a, a bit of um, engineering and whatnot that goes into cre- it, it, it's yeah it's creativity is what we'll say because it's not really engineering it's not that in depth and not that smart so who knows we'll uh, we'll revisit this um, and hopefully by then the skin gauge will be installed and hopefully. By then, I will have decided if I'm keeping this truck or not. Um, I I keep going back and forth, and I know, yeah. You see, so Chris just pulled up a picture of a a 460 interior, and as you can see, there is little in the way of mounting places that aren't on the windshield or on the dashboard itself. So it's kind of like. You know, if you want to use that cubby, the only cubby in the center console, other than the cup holders, is in front of the shifter, between the shifter and the, you know, the, like, radio area. And um, if you want to use that at all, you can't mount anything down there. So I got to get a little creative for a solution. Um, But yeah, to wrap up the GX conversation, I... I've been flip-flopping again. Um, I 
I relisted the truck for sale just to, you know, see if anybody was like, yes, this is exactly what I want. And I can hand it off to a good home and wipe my hands, walk away and, and feel good about it. Um, it's a, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a tough call. It sucks because I, I look at it out my window during, you know, work every day. And I'm like, I am not using this to its capacity in any capacity. And then on the flip side, you know, I, I do do adventures with it occasionally. And I, I do have these, you know, big dreams and hopes and goals that are like true bucket list items of taking this thing out west with my daughter when she's the right age and, you know, and being familiar enough with the truck and having geared up the truck the right way so that by then it's, it's like a seamless, you know, integration of the family vehicle into an adventure. Um, and, you know, growing up, not doing big adventures like that, but where the vehicle was a, a big part of, of vacations and of, you know, of, of our lives, um, because my, you know, my family, my dad made it that way. Like thinking about letting Alexis go is like, I have a feeling I'll regret it in a couple of years because I've already poured my fucking heart and soul into this thing. Um, I have more hours working on this truck in the two years that I've had it than any other vehicle I've owned, regardless of how long I've owned it. So it's, uh, yeah, we'll re we'll revisit this conversation. Um, as we, as I bash my head into the wall to the point that my sanity has escaped and I just make a decision and go fucking go with it. So, yeah, if anybody has words of wisdom, please email me, message me, and do something and talk me off the ledge because, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm losing it in my... Because I'm out of arguments. So, <laughs> I'm out of arguments. I'm out of arguments. Uh, uh, you you I, said it the other day and I was like, that one. And it's yeah. like no, no discourse, no nothing. Like, mm. let's talk about the pros and cons. I was like, pick what you want. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's, I'm too uh, neurotic to just let it fly, you know? Right. But that's it. That's my life. I, I, uh, I will soon be producing some content for ATV.com and Auto Guide. So... Well, and that's part of your conundrum too, is the ATV stuff. Like the GX has to have a trailer. Yeah. If you're going to yeah, always be and, having something around a truck or something right, similar would right. be. And, and Polaris again has been super, super kind. And they've, they've let me keep this thing around forever. And, uh, Ken Am, I don't, did I talk about this Ken Am? I think Spen talked about it, right? When he was on the show. What Ken Am? What Ken Am? Oh shit. Um, Can-Am has loaned us an Outlander 700 to test, which we will be bringing up to our local ATV club shortly. Um, it is bright yellow and it has like the full, like Canada windshield fair and going on. It's, it's pretty crazy. Um, but yeah, you know, like the, a three, a 23, 24. Ooh, that's a question I don't have an answer to. It's okay. it's yellow. It's a yellow 700 XT. Um, XT. Yeah they they replaced the 650, which was a V twin, with that Rotax V twin, with a. It, they call it a 700. I can't remember the exact CCs, but it's a single. Uh, so they're keen to get some word out and some publicity out about that, and it's already been reviewed for auto guide, but I'll, I'll generate some stuff for Hooniverse with it. And, uh, and we'll talk about so it. I, here. Got a sh I got a shot from driver's position with the fairing on it. Yep. All right. That looks about yep. right. Yep. That could very well could be the exact same machine. So yeah, you know, again, I'm, I'm incredibly fortunate and privileged to, yeah, that very, that actually might be the same quad that we have okay. right now. Um, but yeah, no, it, I'm, I'm so lucky to be in the position where I have, you know, press machines and press trucks too, because pretty much every time that I've, I've gone on like a big trip, you know, an automaker has stepped up and said, here's a truck, haul 
haul the ATV with this truck, you know, for a story. And, um, and Chevy did that, the trip that we're taking that can am on up to our local club in a few weeks. Um, I'm hauling the Polaris up to ride alongside the can am while my brother rides the can am and Chevy is loaning me a, a ZR2 HD, the 2500, which nice. Like it's, you know, I, I, I can't, I feel like journalists kind of take this stuff for granted and I, I'm reasonably new to the, to the whole world of, uh, of press cars as far as like the normal rotation of people go. And, and I, I just, I keep finding myself reminding myself to not take any of this for granted and that it's, you know, it, it's the privilege of privileges to be able to do this stuff and be loaned other people's vehicle or other companies' vehicles to spend time with and write about and talk about, even though like for them, these, you know, 75 grand for a truck is dropping the bucket for a company like GM. Um, but, you know, all that said, if the press ATVs were to suddenly go away and the press trucks and vehicles were suddenly to go away, what would I be left with? You know, then I'd a trailer. <laughs> yeah. A trail, like a trailer is easy enough to get rid of. You know, if I end up, if I was in a pickup, then would I find myself saying, oh, fuck, like I should have just kept the Lexus, you know, because I, I, again, so, so fortunate to just like, if I know a trip is coming up long enough out, I just say, Hey, is there, truck i can borrow and so far you know because the big trips at least are infrequently enough for them to be planned well in advance that things have lined up um so so that's the lexus dilemma i don't want to beat this horse any further to death than you and i and my brother and my best friend who's getting married next week and anybody and my wife who will listen to me has already heard so right yeah so uh so that's that. So what is, uh, now that I've talked for the better part of an hour, what's happening with you? Did I literally, nothing. Nothing? <laughs> it's, I attend youth sporting events. And then when I'm not attending youth sporting events, it's, we've been, we've been doing a little bit of stuff around the house, trying to get some stuff squared mm -hmm. away, uh, before winter. Mm -hmm. Um, winter so yeah, just the little things here and there, but yeah, that's, I haven't done. The only thing is there is something leaking on the Sequoia. Um, I started to notice some, some driveway spots the other day, and I did have a, a CV boot replaced back um, after the Moab trip. Mm -hmm. um, and it is on that front of the vehicle. Mm. Um, and I can't quite tell if it's a CV, CV boot for sure, but like you see here, like this backside. Oh God, there's, there's a little dampness. Chris pulled up a and picture it, of what looks like a, a view up through a control arm of yep. the axle going into the front diff. Can you punch yep. in on that a drop? Uh, Somehow. Oh man, I can't really make out any. Right. And so like on there. this, this is wet and you can oh, see this yeah. faint line on the, on the skid where something's it, definitely dripping down. Is it? grease or is it fluid it doesn't look like the axle's ejecting anything at least not from this i don't know i got it i gotta get it looked at so hmm. um interesting you know yeah. when you said uh develop the leak i was i kind of just immediately thought it was going to be the lx no that thing's just chugging along yeah no 15 problems. year old keeps Keeps driving back and forth to school in it. Um, God, it goes through gas. It it ten, huh? I, ten I'm not even yeah. doing the math because it's slightly oversized tires. Yeah. Um, he's running back and forth to school in it almost every day. He's driving to. He's been roughing uh, flag and tackle football games, and so like mm -hmm. he's been driving it down there and back. Oh. And he's like, I'm out of gas. And every time he tells me he's out of gas, he's just down at a quarter. But I did bitch him out about like not going below a quarter for like yeah, fuel pumps, cool fuel and stuff pump, like that. You also don't know the accuracy of the fuel gauge of a vehicle that's 
was it 20 years old? Uh, it is a 2000, so it's 23 years old. 23 years old, yeah. That, um, that fuel gauge, look, if it, but like after having the 80 series and going to a 100 series, it, it's pretty accurate. Like, it's yeah, not probably fine. Um, based so I am one of those people that I'm a little, uh, I always reset the, the trip A meter. Okay. Every time I Each fill time up. Fill up. Yep. So, but I'm also a weirdo and trip B, I restart every Jan one, like yes. every new year's day I go out and I, and I clear um, all the trip B. So I know how many miles I drove that year in each that's vehicle. Interesting. I feel like um, people usually do one trip for a tank of gas and one trip for oil changes. I've never heard of anybody do it for a calendar year. Yeah. But like I have service lights that turn on for oil changes. Like I don't need a yeah. trip meter for that. <laughs> that is true. Like you have a, you have a Toyota based project or product. Every time that service required light comes on, you know, it's time for an oil change. So and starts uh, to flash at you as you're starting to turn the vehicle on, as you're getting closer and closer in mileage. Like, yeah, I haven't had that in this Toyota four by four. You haven't driven 5,000 miles in that truck yet. Oh, no, I've driven 5,000 miles. I, it's just, I've driven 6,500 miles in two years. So I've just changed oh the oil, God. like, when I feel like it. I would say it. I would be in the same oil still. Like, it would not no, have changed. No, no, I'm too paranoid and, like, in the weird world where I do keep this thing long-term. Like, you know, the couple bucks it costs to change the oil is, is worth the worth a piece of mind on the Blackstone test in 20 years, you know? I guess. Um, so yeah, no. Bit. Um, Suburban's terrible. Um, really? It drives like noise? shit right now. Is that noise still um, there? Huh? It wasn't, didn't you have some weird noise from like the leveling kit that he took off? So the, the, the noise in the front end is the bottom bushing on the driver's side um, coilover. Um, it's the, literally the shock is moving on the bushing and it's hitting the control arm. Careful, um, those motions there, buddy. Nah, I don't care. Somebody can clip it out and they can make me famous for, uh, jack off motions. That's fine. Control. But, um, yeah, it wasn't up down. It was forward to back. Okay. But yeah, uh, it just, it's felt like it's been riding like shit lately. Um, I've been looking up stuff to try and figure out like when Magna ride shocks go, like what. Of what is happening so it's all it's still all held up by springs like it's coilovers yeah. in the front and then just standalone springs in the back with the uh, dampers normally the way they are and it's just i i don't i have those reddish steins on it and i'm just not thrilled with them mm -hmm. how many miles um, are almost spit out let me get to my spreadsheet yes I, I Magna Ride is talked about a lot on new vehicles. It is not something that frequently comes up on vehicles as they as the miles are put on. So I, I hear I hear about them all the time that the shocks fail and they fail really? frequently. Yeah. Huh. I especially I'm the right. GM ones, which Wait. to be honest, that's what was licensed by everybody. So well, I mean nobody's putting a hundred thousand miles on a Ferrari with Magna Ride, so I'm sure somebody has. <laughs> somebody has. Yeah. Development drivers on the ring have. But um, is let's there, see. so there, you, they hear about them failing, but is there a normal serviceable life for Magna Ride? Or is it I just don't know. I've been totally able to figure that out. Yeah. That's yeah. my understanding is that it is a crapshoot. Like, I know there were some people who had Magna Ride on. on I can't remember if it was Corvettes or Camaros or something or CTSVs, but they, like they were getting not a lot of miles out of them. Right. And then some cars get tons of miles out of stock Magna Ride. So, so the the Suburban we purchased in April of 2021. We are now into October of 2023. So in, in April of 2021, it had a 20, 127,000 miles. Okay, so you've had so 30 one, months. I am now at 188, about to roll over 189. So you've put 62,000 on it in. So you're doing like 20 to 25,000 miles a year, roughly? Yeah. Okay. And the average American is 12 to 15. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, I. 
You're not you're to, not average. You're no, way I, below average. Yeah, I'm on the opposite <laughs> end of the spectrum. There were yeah. there was probably a three or four year stretch where I was doing thirty five thousand miles a year. So right. I, I'm averaging so myself. Is what's happening? The, the Vredesteins went on December of twenty one. Okay. Uh, a hundred. Yeah, hundred and forty two thousand miles. So you got twenty six um, on them. That's. No more than that. Yeah, Wait, what one, did you say? 46? Oh, you're 188. I'm at, yeah, I'm at 189, oh, so, so yeah, I got 46,000 miles. 46 on them. Okay, what load rating are they? Uh, That's a great question. Because if they're... Actually, it doesn't really matter. If, if you're coming up on 50,000 miles on those, yeah. in any capacity, like, not many all-terrain tires these days are repeatedly in multiple cases getting 50,000 miles. I mean, well, and so, but here's the deal though. Remember I had to replace two of them. You did. Um, yeah. But that was, I only got, let's see. I only got 12,000 miles out of those tires before I replaced the two. Mm -hmm. And, and so the two new ones went on at 154. Those are still at 30,000 30, miles on them. Yeah. You got, yeah. That's interesting. I would, uh, I would talk to our friend at Fredestein and and just have a conversation because that's probably the kind of feedback that they want. You know, because you're using the Suburban the way that a normal user and buyer of these tires would actually, act, you know, go about having them right. involved in their life. Um, yeah, I, I would... Email him if you want me to reopen that chat. I can for you. No, I can. I'll, I, I know who it is. I got. I got Roger's email. I'll definitely yeah. shoot him an email. Um, that's interesting. But yeah, that's... the road noise that's coming out of the driver's front tire is driving mm -hmm. me nuts. Like I can hear it constantly. Is that the shock that you said the bushing was dying on? Yeah, but then the I... bushing the bushing issue is only like right when you move. It never makes a noise once the vehicle's in motion. But if it is making noise, chances are it is moving while in motion, even if it's not making noise, which could be contributing to wear. Right. Maybe. I so. Know. I don't want to replace the bushing. I'm bored. It's just the bushing that the coilover mounts on, just like the little like sleeve the bottom bushing. One? Yeah, it's a sleeve bushing that you put a screw through. I don't know. I'll do full suspension lift on it before I'll fuck with that bushing. Uh, yeah, you need shop press. Yeah, I don't or know how to deal with shop press. Really, really, <laughs> really strong person. I I know a guy named Ron who's really strong and has <laughs> available tools. I just yeah. don't. I just don't I just, care. I like, I want to see Ron just squeezing like you know <laughs> something to push the bushing out. But it it makes me look at Tundras with Michelin. Defender LTX is on them all the time. Yeah. Getting thousands and thousands of miles out of them. And it's just be like, listen, if I get back to a quiet ride. And the 75,000 mile tire. Yeah. You could probably get a set of takeoffs from a stock vehicle for like pennies on the dollar. I'm not quite sure the tire diameter matching up with mine. Um, uh, well, you could fit. Like, I know I can stock. find an 18. Yeah, but you can fit a little bigger than stock. Right, um, but I'm not sure the freaking um, the actual tire size. Okay. The tire Defender rate. is great. My dad uh, put another set on his Silverado, on his 2500. Right. And, and he expects to probably get... God, he, he's one of those people who very proactively replaces tires, and he'll still get 50... 55,000 miles out of that set with, you know, a th quarter or third of that towing over 5,000 pounds. Right. There's a thread on Bud right now that somebody was like, <laughs> it was like a dissertation. Like the Michelin LTX is the perfect altar and tire for almost everybody. And people are like, yeah, it's a great tire, but it's not really an all-terrain. <laughs> right, it's not an all-terrain tire. Shot yourself in the foot on that. You know, call a duck a duck, but that's not a duck. 
Yeah, I'm trying to find. So I've got Tire Rack's got a Tundra at 275, 65, 18. Okay. And I do have 18s. Um, but I can't remember what I actually have on the Suburban. Um, um let's see. Because I did. Oh, Tyrek, you're not very helpful right now. Like, just let me search what I want without having to give you if extra my information. Computer cooperates. This will be an easy search. And I'm sure the audio listeners are so thrilled with us Googling right now. But, you know, it's late on the East Coast. We can. So we can it's pretty. So the, the uh, Tundra size is wider. How much wider? Uh, what are tire sizes rated at? The two, the 300 number, it's a millimeters, right? Yep. So it's 10 millimeters wider for the Tundra. Okay, so that'll or point four inches. That'll be probably fine. Consult your local forums, but I tend to think you will be, you will be okay. I'm yeah, looking so at start... your UTV driver article. You didn't actually mention the size in this. No, I don't think I did. <laughs> Uh, okay. Well, let's see if I can get a close up of what you got on there. They're not bad looking tires, I will say. They like actually did a good job. All right. Very, very um, Blizzak sidewall esque. Yeah, I have a ton of. So the other thing is, like, I have Toyos on everything else, and they're great on everything else. I just don't want the road noise of an all terrain tire mm. on something that we really only put highway miles on so get the the michelin defender ltx ms2 it's the one that's got the three peak snow rating yeah because i know you take that thing up into the mountains in colorado and montana and shit so yeah and it snows it's, here every now and then it's there yeah um i might still have michelin contact if you want me to hunt i can hunt yeah if you still got that i'll give it a look yeah do me a favor, message me, and I'll... I'll give you some tire uh, sizes. Let me... I'll just write it down. Okay, on that note, as we're just digging in the archives, we um, should probably wrap. Yeah. Let's see here. I have... Those are when I was doing that. I swear you don't have your tire size on things. your spreadsheet? Um, Wait, do I have 275, my... 65, 18. Which is exactly the Tundra size. So then you know what you have to do. I said 18, right? Yep. Yeah. You know what you have to do. I need to find Facebook Marketplace and find takeoffs from a Tundra. Yep. Some dude that was like, I'm going to get Nitto Terra Grapplers. Oh, <laughs> I said Nitto Terra Grapplers because my neighbor has them on his uh, Sierra. I um, had. Nitto Terra Grapplers on my Avalanche. I've driven a couple vehicles with them, including the TRD Pro 4Runner. And I still cannot get behind them. You can't get by them? Yeah, I just don't. Uh, they're squishy. They just feel squishy. Which, some people like that. Some people just want everything to be a pillow or like a cloud, but I prefer things to actually, I prefer when you know how me what many, doing. how many freaking sets of twenties there are. I mean, There's so many. Steal a set of twenties. But you don't want twenties. Dude, somebody wants a thousand dollars for these. Get the fuck out of here. Hell no. To be honest, they're kind of fancy looking uh, rims, which won't fit. I guess industry. I could put the rims on the Sequoia. And <laughs> it's a boat pattern, right? Well, so's the the LX. Like if I if I don't want to have the oversized, That's so funny. I could just switch to this. You should get like <laughs> like Michelin's for your son for the LX, just for commuting. And then and steal the Toyos for the suburban. 
Aye, aye, aye. Although he's probably got what sixteens on there, that's not fitting over the suburban brakes. Yeah, no, no, he's he's definitely smaller. Yeah. Ugh, I wish I could fit. 16. I think I joked about that already. You could um, just you'd have to fit like GMT seven hundred brakes onto the onto the suburban. Two thirty five. Fuck. <laughs> All right, I'll do shopping later. So yeah, yeah. So okay. Well, on that note, I. Yeah, let's call it. Definitely. Uh, you can like and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. You can follow us on YouTube. I think the show went live tonight. I think I got an email that said the show was live. So if you're cool. commenting on the YouTube tonight, sorry that we didn't pay attention to you. Um, the last no, like six shows have not gone live. So the fact that this one went is just hilarious to me. Nope. Nope. No comments. Didn't. We're good. No comments. Okay. Yep. Could you just say um, it didn't? Would have made us look better. Yeah. Nice. Thanks, YouTube, for finally working. Fuck you, YouTube. Fucking YouTube. All uh, this shit. Uh, anyway, Ross is no not like the one from Friends. I'm at a landing dad. Yep. We did a show. Thanks, guys. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it. Mm-hmm.